Lesson 4 The Flood Sabbath Afternoon April 16 In the days of Noah, the human race yet retained much of its early vigor. But a few generations had passed since Adam had access to the tree which was to prolong life, and man's existence was still measured by centuries. Had that long-lived people, with their rare powers to plan and execute, devoted themselves to the service of God, they would have made their Creator's name a praise in the earth and would have answered the purpose for which He gave them life. But they failed to do this. There were many giants, men of great stature and strength, renowned for wisdom, skillful in devising the most cunning and wonderful works, but their guilt in giving loose rein to iniquity was in proportion to their skill and mental ability. God bestowed upon these antediluvians many and rich gifts, but they used his bounties to glorify themselves and turn them into a curse by fixing their affections upon the gifts instead of the giver. They employed the gold and silver, the precious stones and the choice wood in the construction of habitations for themselves and endeavored to excel one another in beautifying their dwellings with the most skillful workmanship. They sought only to gratify the desires of their own proud hearts and reveled in scenes of pleasure and wickedness. Not desiring to retain God in their knowledge, they soon came to deny His existence. They adored nature in place of the God of nature. They glorified human genius, worshipped the works of their own hands, and taught their children to bow down to graven images. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 90 and 91 Of the antediluvians we read, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 13. God warned the inhabitants of the old world of what he purposed to do in cleansing the earth of its impurity, but they laughed to scorn what they regarded as a superstitious prediction. They mocked at Noah's warning of a coming flood. When Christ was upon the earth, he gave warning of what was coming upon Jerusalem because the people had rejected truth, despising the messages that God had sent. But his warning was unheeded. The Lord has sent us, by his ambassadors, messages of warning, declaring that the end of all things is at hand. Some will listen to these warnings, but by the vast majority, they will be disregarded. Thus will it be when Christ comes. Farmers, merchants, lawyers, tradesmen will be wholly engrossed in business, and upon them the day of the Lord will come as a snare. In Heavenly Places, page 343. Sunday, April 17. Preparation for the Flood More than 100 years before the flood, the Lord sent an angel to faithful Noah to make known to him that he would no longer have mercy upon the corrupt race. But he would not have them ignorant of his design. He would instruct Noah and make him a faithful preacher to warn the world of its coming destruction that the inhabitants of the earth might be left without excuse. Noah was to preach to the people and also to prepare an ark as God should direct him for the saving of himself and family. He was not only to preach, but his example in building the ark was to convince all that he believed what he preached. Noah and his family were not alone in fearing and obeying God, but Noah was the most pious and holy of any upon the earth and was the one whose life God preserved to carry out his will in building the ark and warning the world of its coming doom. The Story of Redemption, pages 62 and 63 Noah stood like a rock amid the tempest. He was surrounded by every species of wickedness and moral corruption. 
But amid popular contempt and ridicule, amid universal wickedness and disobedience, he distinguished himself by his holy integrity and unwavering faithfulness. While the world around him were disregarding God and were indulging in all manner of extravagant dissipation, which led to violence and crimes of every kind, the faithful preacher of righteousness declared to that generation that a flood of water was to deluge the world because of the unsurpassed wickedness of its inhabitants. He warned them to repent and believe and find refuge in the ark. A power attended his words, for it was the voice of God to man through his servant. Connection with God made him strong in the strength of infinite power, while for one hundred and twenty years his solemn warning voice fell upon the ears of the men of that generation in regard to events which, so far as human wisdom could judge, seemed impossible. How simple and childlike, amid the unbelief of a scoffing world, was the faith of Noah. He gave to the world an example of believing just what God said. Reflecting Christ, page 322. It is a fearful thing to treat lightly the truth which has convinced our understanding and touched our hearts. We cannot with impunity reject the warnings which God in mercy sends us. A message was sent from heaven to the world in Noah's day, and the salvation of men depended upon the manner in which they treated that message. Because they rejected the warning, the Spirit of God was withdrawn from the sinful race, and they perished in the waters of the flood. Looking down to the last days, the same infinite power declares, concerning those who received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. As they reject the teachings of his word, God withdraws his spirit and leaves them to the deceptions which they love. Early Writings, page 45 Monday, April 18 The Event of the Flood The Bible record is in harmony with itself and with the teaching of nature. Of the first day employed in the work of creation is given the record, the evening and the morning were the first day. Genesis chapter 1 verse 5. And the same in substance is said of each of the first six days of creation week. Each of these periods, inspiration declares to have been a day consisting of evening and morning, like every other day since that time. In regard to the work of creation itself, the divine testimony is, He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Psalm 33, verse 9. Before the flood, the development of vegetable and animal life was immeasurably superior to that which has since been known. At the flood, the surface of the earth was broken up, marked changes took place, and in the reformation of the earth's crust, were preserved many evidences of the life previously existing. The vast forests buried in the earth at the time of the flood, and since changed to coal, form the extensive coal fields and yield the supplies of oil that minister to our comfort and convenience today. These things, as they are brought to light, are so many witnesses mutely testifying to the truth of the Word of God. Education, page 129. God's love for the world was not manifest because He sent His Son, but because He loved the world, He sent His Son into the world that divinity clothed with humanity might touch humanity while divinity lays hold of divinity. Though sin had produced the gulf between man and his God, a divine benevolence provided a plan to bridge that gulf. And what material did He use? A part of Himself. The brightness of the Father's glory came to a world all seared and marred with the curse, and in his own divine character, in his own divine body, bridged the gulf. The windows of heaven were opened, and the showers of heavenly grace in healing streams came to our benighted world. Our High Calling, page 12 There is need that much time be spent in secret prayer. 
in close communion with God. Thus only can victories be won. Eternal vigilance is the price of safety. The Lord's covenant is with His saints. Everyone is to discern his weak points of character and guard against them with vigor. Those who have been buried with Christ in baptism and been raised in the likeness of his resurrection have pledged themselves to live in newness of life. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 258. Tuesday, April 19. The End of the Flood. As the violence of the storm increased, trees, buildings, rocks, and earth were hurled in every direction. The terror of man and beast was beyond description. Above the roar of the tempest was heard the wailing of a people that had despised the authority of God. Satan himself, who was compelled to remain in the midst of the warring elements, feared for his own existence. In that terrible hour, the people saw that the transgression of God's law had caused their ruin. Yet while, through fear of punishment, they acknowledged their sin, they felt no true contrition, no abhorrence of evil. They would have returned to their defiance of heaven had the judgment been removed. So when God's judgment shall fall upon the earth before its deluge by fire, the impenitent will know just where and what their sin is, the despising of his holy law. Yet they will have no more true repentance than did the old world sinners. Love, no less than justice, demanded that God's judgment should put a check on sin. The avenging water swept over the last retreat, and the despisers of God perished in the black depths. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 99 to 101. The waters had been fifteen cubits above the highest mountains. The Lord remembered Noah, and as the waters decreased, he caused the ark to rest upon the top of a cluster of mountains which God in his power had preserved and made them to stand fast all through that violent storm. These mountains were but a little distance apart, and the ark moved about and rested upon one, then another of these mountains, and was no more driven upon the boundless ocean. This gave great relief to Noah and all within the ark. As the mountains and hills appeared, they were in a broken, rough condition, and all around them appeared like a sea of roiled water or soft mud. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 77 By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. While Noah was giving his warning message to the world, his works testified of his sincerity. It was thus that his faith was perfected and made evident. He gave the world an example of believing just what God says. All that he possessed, he invested in the ark. As he began to construct that immense boat on dry ground, multitudes came from every direction to see the strange sight and to hear the earnest, fervent words of the singular preacher. Every blow struck upon the ark was a witness to the people. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 95 Oh, how easy for us to forget God while he never forgets us. He visits us with his mercies every hour. Our High Calling, page 314. Wednesday, April 20. The Covenant, Part 1. In the joy of their release, 
Noah did not forget him by whose gracious care they had been preserved. His first act after leaving the ark was to build an altar and offer from every kind of clean beast and fowl a sacrifice, thus manifesting his gratitude to God for deliverance and his faith in Christ, the great sacrifice. This offering was pleasing to the Lord, and a blessing resulted, not only to the patriarch and his family, but to all who should live upon the earth. The Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. Here was a lesson for all succeeding generations. Noah had come forth upon a desolate earth, but before preparing a house for himself, he built an altar to God. His stock of cattle was small and had been preserved at great expense, yet he cheerfully gave a part to the Lord as an acknowledgement that all was his. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 105 and 106. Adam and Eve, at their creation, had a knowledge of the law of God. They were acquainted with its claims upon them. Its precepts were written upon their hearts. When man fell by transgression, the law was not changed, but a remedial system was established to bring him back to obedience. The promise of a Savior was given, and sacrificial offerings pointing forward to the death of Christ as the great sin offering were established. Adam taught his descendants the law of God, and it was handed down from father to son through successive generations. But notwithstanding the gracious provision for man's redemption, there were few who accepted it and rendered obedience. By transgression, the world became so vile that it was necessary to cleanse it by the flood from its corruption. The law was preserved by Noah and his family, and Noah taught his descendants the Ten Commandments. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 363. As Noah looked upon the powerful beasts of prey that came forth with him from the ark, he feared that his family, numbering only eight persons, would be destroyed by them. But the Lord sent an angel to his servant with the assuring message, The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Before this time, God had given man no permission to eat animal food. He intended that the race should subsist wholly upon the productions of the earth. But now that every green thing had been destroyed, he allowed them to eat the flesh of the clean beasts that had been preserved in the ark. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 107. Thursday, April 21, The Covenant, Part 2 It is not because of inherent power that year by year the earth produces her bounties and continues her motion round the sun. The hand of God guides the planets and keeps them in position in their orderly march through the heavens. It is through His power that summer and winter, seed time and harvest, day and night follow each other in their regular succession. It is by His word that vegetation flourishes, that the leaves appear and the flowers bloom. Every good thing we have, each ray of sunshine and shower of rain, every morsel of food, every moment of life is a gift of love. While we were yet unloving and unlovely in character, hateful and hating one another, our Heavenly Father had mercy on us. After that the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Titus chapter 3 verses 3 to 5. His love received will make us, in like manner, kind and tender not merely toward those who please us, but to the most faulty and erring and sinful. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, pages 74 and 75 As we look upon this bow, 
the seal and sign of God's promise to man, that the tempest of his wrath should no more desolate our world by the waters of a flood, we contemplate that other than finite eyes are looking upon this glorious sight. Angels rejoice as they gaze upon this precious token of God's love to man. The world's Redeemer looks upon it, for it was through his instrumentality that this bow was made to appear in the heavens as a token or covenant of promise to man. God himself looks upon the bow in the clouds and remembers his everlasting covenant between himself and man. The bow represents Christ's love which encircles the earth and reaches unto the highest heavens connecting men with God and linking earth with heaven. As we gaze upon the beautiful sight, we may be joyful in God, assured that He Himself is looking upon this token of His covenant, and that as He looks upon it, He remembers the children of earth to whom it was given. Their afflictions, perils, and trials are not hidden from Him. We may rejoice in hope, for the bow of God's covenant is over us. He never will forget the children of His care. How difficult for the mind of finite man to take in the peculiar love and tenderness of God and his matchless condescension when he said, I will look upon the bow in the cloud and remember thee. Our High Calling, page 314 We are to send our petitions through the darkest clouds that Satan may cast over us and let our faith pierce to the throne of God, encircled by the rainbow of promise, the assurance that God is true, that in Him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. We are to come before the mercy seat with reverence, calling up to our mind the promises that God has given, contemplating the goodness of God, and offering up thankful praises for His unchangeable love. We are not to trust in our finite prayers, but in the word of our Heavenly Father, in His assurance of His love for us. In Heavenly Places, page 125. For further reading, Spiritual Gifts, Disguised Infidelity, Volume 3, pages 94 and 95, and The Upward Look, Time for Action page 88.